My question is, <clears throat> um, when you look at the logic, as your, as your speech indicated, and when you look at the results, NAFTA and the other 18 countries where we have free trade agreements represent about 400 million people, and it's half of our exports. And as successful as those agreements have been, the perception is they're very unpopular, particularly NAFTA. One third of our exports go to 145 million people, but yet we want to demonize our, our neighbors rather than countries where we've had limited success. Have we reached the point where we need, let's call it a limited war, not a thermonuclear war, but do we need a good old fashioned trade war to remind people in this country and others of the benefits and the costs associated with trade and trade liberalization? I hope not. <laughs> uh, just for the record, I'm not in favor of war. Uh, 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 look, I, I think hopefully uh, we can have that kind of engagement and build that kind of support without seeing people adversely. <laughs> Particularly, you know, I mentioned, you, know, you raise tariffs on imports, on most of these imported goods, say from China. It's the it's working class, low income Americans who spend a disproportionate amount of their income on tradable goods, food, clothing, footwear. People who are least able to afford seeing their prices of back to school clothing go up to 20%, 25% are the ones who will be adversely affected. Now we shouldn't have to go through that experience and they shouldn't have to go through that experience for the American public to understand how important it is that we remain proactive, show leadership, not allow others to define the rules of the road and take these markets from us. And uh, I'm hopeful that the new administration will focus on that. Right. Uh, I'm Sweeney with Politico. Uh, I just had a question about, we talked a lot about the need to address domestic policy and workers and communities and, and engage broader or longer engagement with the public on trade that hasn't been done. Um, I, would, I would just kind of looking back, when you were in the White House, you had the presidency here, when you guys sat down to talk about kind of the future of trade policy and what would be done under this administration. I mean, was there a discussion at a, a, on, you know, on a broader level of what had to be done policy-wise with worker programs, with all the things you mentioned? <laughs> At what point did you, did, was the writing on the wall when Korea, Colombia, Panama came through that you had to address these things? And, you know, you look back and you, you were thinking, do you think maybe we should have made a better push on some of these to, to address some of these frustrations that we saw? So, um, I, think if you, I think if you look back at the history of President Obama's budgets, you'll find that a number of the things that I mentioned are in there. I mean, it's been, whether it's lifelong learning or free community college or skill building uh, or infrastructure, a number of these ideas have been part of the president's proposals for years. And every year, you know, we, we fought for those. Uh, there just wasn't any support on the other side. And again, I'm, I'm hopeful, and I don't mean that to sound like a partisan comment, I'm hopeful that now, coming out of this election, we're hearing from both Republicans and, uh, Republicans and Democrats the importance of doing more for workers and communities that are affected by, by uh, adversely affected by change. Um, I'm hoping that that leads to a real discussion about uh, you know, not just TAA, but the other things that the federal government and others can do to make sure that we are ready to take full advantage of the global economy and the technological change that we are experiencing every day. And I'm Frank, I'm very worried that given that not just the global economy, but the, the pace of technological change that we are seeing is going to have a much more significant impact potentially. And we need to be prepared to help people who are displaced by that and to make sure that our young people are being trained to succeed in that environment. If I could add, I mean, our surveys show that consistently the public believes that the pace of change in life is too fast and it's undermining their traditional way of life and they resent that. And globalization is change on steroids. So the pace, the accelerating pace of change, I think, 
is one of the issues that any administration is going to have to deal with. And as you so uh, insightfully point out, it's hard to vote on technological change. It's easy to vote on globalization. It's easy to vote on trade. It's easy to kind of protect us from what's out there by building walls or whatever. And I do think that that's going to be one of the challenges even a, a Democratic president would have faced because it, trade is actually just a small piece of this, of this change that people are, are encountering. Um, Uh, you mentioned uh, before, uh, Louis Leibovitz, Learning Town. Um, you have um, mentioned the last trade vote where uh, 28 Democrats um, were in favor of um, TPA, I believe it was. If we're going to get that to 38 or 48 or 58, maybe even 100 Democratic votes in the future, um, an elephant in the room is organized labor. How would you address the idea of organized labor? being uh, an obstacle to the very things that you've been addressing in your, in, not only in your tenure, which was great, but also in your speech today. Um, how do you address those points and get them to be supporting these ideas instead of opposing them? Yeah, we spend uh, an enormous amount of time uh, and effort engaging with organized labor on our trade. They had tremendous input throughout the process. You know, we have a labor advisory committee. It's got 23 labor union presidents on it. They all have staff who come in and meet with us regularly. You know, I remember when I was in my previous job at the White House, and we were launching TPP uh, negotiations. Uh, some folks from the AFL-CIO came in, and they wanted to talk about footnote two of the labor chapter and whether we should refer to ILO conventions or the ILO declaration. I said, you know, I'm delighted to talk about footnote two. But why, but how that gets resolved will not have a single effect, will not affect a single worker in America. You know, why don't you help us think through the entire agreement? What are the challenges that American workers are really facing in the global economy? And how can we use this agreement to address those challenges? And, and to uh, some of their credit, they came back with ideas for our state-owned enterprise chapter, other for labor chapter, for our tariff negotiations, and they had a tremendous impact on the negotiations. Uh, I remember at one point we, I was speaking with a number of the labor union presidents individually, and I was going through with them what it is we were going to negotiate in the labor chapter and with countries like Vietnam and Malaysia. And you know, one of them said to me, if you get this, it will be a game changer. Well, we didn't get that. We got 120% of it. We got more than we had actually briefed them on. At the end of the day, for whatever reasons, and I can't speak for them, we couldn't get their support. But I am convinced that this agreement is more progressive in terms of protecting workers' rights, raising labor standards, making strides on environmental issues than any, certainly by than any previous trade agreement, and objectively, Makes, takes steps forward in areas we've never been able to achieve before. Now, quite apart from TPP, Mexico just passed fundamental labor reform, constitutional reform of their conciliation and arbitration body. Now that is, that is huge. It is what labor and their supporters on Capitol Hill have been asking for for years. And Mexico has now done it. So I, I, think, uh, I think it's just very important that um, uh, we do have ongoing and constant dialogue. And I'm hopeful that while they've been very supportive of our trade enforcement efforts, we appreciate that, uh, that ultimately they will find a way to being able to find to support this. Because you know, this is my, my, guess my, my uh, uh, frustration on this issue is, I've asked them, I said, by, by, by working to defeat TPP, what have you done to improve workers' rights in Vietnam? If TPP doesn't move forward, you know, what have you done to protect human trafficking in Malaysia? I know that if TPP passes, we have the tools to make progress on this issue. If 
you're going to read one part of TPP. Read the 12 page Vietnam Consistency Labor Plan. It's a remarkable document about reforming a communist country to have independent unions that can raise their own finances, elect their own leaders, strike, affiliate with who they want to, and they don't get access to our market unless they do. That's real progress. And without TPP, that's, there's no hook to be able to enforce that progress. So, um, uh, in my ongoing dialogue with labor and with the environmental community, I think the, the issue we need to push is in the absence of tools like this, how, how are we going to make progress on these issues? Because we know that trade agreements themselves can make significant progress. Mr. Ambassador, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here. Uh,